Welcome to the 2012 ANZIG Public Sector Excellence Awards. I would like to begin at the beginning by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people and their ancestors as the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting today and recognise their unique contribution to Australia's environmental and cultural heritage, past, present and future. Uh, my name's Mark Evans and I'm the director of the ANZOG Institute for Governance here at the University of Canberra and your host for today's awards. Um, you may have, have noticed from, from my accent that I was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize a couple of days ago, um, <laughs> along with 500 million other European Union citizens. Um, I have to say it was a bit of a surprise. Um, I'm not looking forward to that ceremony because it's going to take a bit of time. Um, lucky it wasn't China, really. <laughs> Look, it's absolutely wonderful to see so many people here this lunchtime to celebrate the work of the Australian Public Service, but I guess we all love an award ceremony. We would like to extend a special welcome to the family and friends of our award winners, to members of the ANZOG family, to the Australian Public Service Commissioner, Steve Sedgwick, to the head of the ACT Public Service, Andrew Cappy Wood, um, and to the Vice-Chancellor, of the University of Canberra, Professor Stephen Parker, for his continued support for the work of the Institute. A special welcome and thank you must also be reserved for the Right Honourable Gary Gray, the Minister for the Public Service, for his significant support and contribution to today's event. Now, the ANZOG Public Sector Excellence Awards are awarded to outstanding pub uh, Australian public servants at different levels of governance who demonstrate excellence in leadership, policy innovation or policy delivery that leads to positive social or economic outcomes for, the, for Australian citizens. So today's award winners are nominated by ANZIG Fellows and chosen by an awards panel chaired by Emeritus Professor Meredith Edwards. This is going to be a celebration in two parts. In part one, the Right Honourable Gary Gray, the Minister for the Public Service, will place this occasion within a broader institutional context and addresses on the topic, the future of the Australian Public Service. And then in part two, we will celebrate the work of six outstanding public servants who, in our view, are meeting the challenges of 21st century governance. So could I now ask Professor Stephen Parker, the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Canberra, to introduce the Minister for the Public Service, Gary Gray. Thank you very much, Mark. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the University of Canberra. I'd like to acknowledge the work of the ANZOG Institute under Mark Evans' exemplary leadership which I think epitomises what the university is trying to do, which is to make an early and important difference to the world around us. Uh, any speaker who offers a talk on the future of dot, 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 catches my attention at the moment. Um, I've been thinking about and writing about the future of universities, which I think is nothing short of transformational. The issue is whether we shape that future or that future happens to us. So. A talk by uh, the Honourable Gary Gray on the future of the Australian Public Service is both uh, topical and of broader interest. The Honourable Gary Gray, AOMP, is the Australian Labour Party member for the Division of Brand in Western Australia in the Australian House of Representatives. He is the Special Minister of State and the Minister for the, Pub for the Public Service and Integrity. Um, Briefly, just now, I asked him whether he would like me to read out all of the biography which you already have in your, um, in your invitations, or would he like that time spent talking about the future of the Australian Public Service, and he voted for the latter. So, um, without any more ado, can I please ask you to welcome the Honourable Gary Gray. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen and Mark. I notice out there Steve Sedgwick um, and various other traditional owners of the Australian Public Service. Um, and I, of course, acknowledge the Ngunnawal people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet 
and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Um, I also would like to thank uh, Dan Gerritsen from my office and Derek uh, Drinkwater for the effort that they've put into uh, trying to discipline my words today uh, and doing what would be more conventionally thought of as writing a speech. I thank you very much for that effort. Um, and also to our award recipients, um, outstanding people, um, outstanding public servants, uh, and real contributors to helping build this fantastic place that we live in um, called our country. I'm, I'm fond of, of making the point that of all the countries on the face of this planet that have been created in the last 120 years, none has been more successful than Australia. And the common thread that joins our great success as a nation uh, is the quality of our public service. The work that it does to create leadership, a national identity and a sense of purpose is literally second to none in any like country with any similar historical experience. Um, for me, that cannot either be denied uh, and should never be uh, thought of lightly. The role of good public servants, uh, the role of uh, the stewardship of our public service is so critically important to good national outcomes in any area. Now, I do have that speech that Dan and Derek put work into, and I was amused um, by a paragraph which I, I thought I'd reuse uh, from Ian Watt from uh, about a week and a half ago. Uh, where Ian said that, um, as the Secretary of Prime Minister and Cabinet uh, recently said of the APS, we employ people with mind-boggling ranges of skills and qualifications. We do everything from serve on the counter at Centrelink to undertake macroeconomic forecasting, from carrying out world-class defence scientific research in, and to running a world-class and low-cost pharmaceutical benefit scheme and delivering multi-million dollar age projects in far-flung corners of the world. Of course, we do all of that. Um, Steve had, uh, sorry, Ian had then added um, that the public service also keep highly accurate records of cabinet meetings. Um, and since in my two years of being a minister, uh, I've learned uh, the importance of arguing about cabinet minutes and decisions. Um, I decided in my version of that paragraph to drop off his last clause. I tried to write in and, and suggest to Dan that it ought to have as a final clause. Um, that the public service also provides highly accurate weather forecasts. Um, <laughs> but that would, of course, have been changing Ian's words, so we just cut it short. Um, it is worth reflecting on what we mean by good governance. In the context of the modern public service, good governance means so many things. Uh, it, of course, means efficiency in spending taxpayers' money. Um, it of course means that we have a merit-based public service. Increasingly, it also means that we have a public service with such dexterity and flexibility that the challenges that we face as a nation and as a community can be best and most effectively managed in whatever form they, those challenges may come. I began to think of a young public servant who might have began working in the public service in Canberra in the early 1970s. And I'd asked Dan and uh, Derek to, to just tell me a little bit about a young public servant who would have started here in the 1970s. And they did that, and it's somewhere in this bloody speech. Um, but I can't find it now. But when you think of a public servant in the 1970s working largely in uh, a line, largely in a simple clerical function, uh, working in a uh, relatively large bureaucracy, but at no time uh, would his mind have turned to the greater policy challenges of our nation. At no time, if that person had begun working for us 
in 1971 uh, would he, and predominantly they were he's, uh, would that average public servant uh, have had to consider uh, a future as a policy maker? Largely, I suspect, because the general policy direction had been determined in about 1964, uh, and essentially the lucky country was just continuing to roll its way through. If we began to look at that average public servant uh, 20 years later, in 1991, uh, that average public servant was still a male. And that average public servant, before the massive advent of ICT systems throughout the management of the public sector, still had a similar kind of function, even though the great reforms of Coombe, uh, of Block and others had substantially reoriented our public service. So as our country faced the challenges that we met through the 1980s in focusing our national economy into a global economy, into having a floating exchange rate, into realising that tariff protections really weren't going to work, into realising uh, that having a balanced budget and a transparent budget process Simple, small reforms, such as forward estimates, providing a degree of rigour, transparency and competitiveness for our economy that flowed through effectively to a public sector. You couldn't really have a public sector that was inward looking while we had a nation that was now outward looking. But even with those changes, as the 2000s come along, and our average public servant is now a early 40s uh, woman uh, with a much broader policy perspective uh, and much better career uh, prospects than ever before, although still not good enough, the challenges become different. They become the challenges of a wealthy economy that is outward looking and with a capability in our public service to make decisions quicker and in a more capable way than ever before. But even at that, in 2000, we still don't see coming down the track towards us the impact of the threat of global terror. We don't see the impact of the growth of commodity prices and the resources boom. The truth of that is because we can never be sure of what is in front of us or what the next challenge will be, the best thing that we can have is a highly capable, flexible public service. I think through some challenges that we've dealt with over the last few years, and I'll focus on one that many of you will be spectacularly unaware of. Because we're used to, in contexts such as this, contemplating the fantastic response of the Australian Public Service to events like Cyclone Yassi, or events such as the bushfires in Victoria. Um, I'll make reference to a very small weather event, um, but it was a weather event that was highly um, isolated in the north of Western Australia, um, a, an intense uh, a tropical low descended through the Kimberley and in a particular set of mountain valleys, only three of them, uh, dropped more rain in the space of four hours than you would normally get in this subtropical region in the space of a year. Um, and the consequence of the flood that generated through the locality of Warman uh, was that 450 Aboriginal people were relocated. They weren't relocated far it was only a couple of hundred kilometres up to Kununurra. Uh, but that relocation meant that Indigenous people who had a real affinity for the land on which they lived and were not people from the community of Kununurra were therefore dispossessed of their position in their country. The response of government in Western Australia, the event happened on a Friday. Uh, by the Monday, a Cabinet decision had been made to provide resources to deal with the community in Warman. By Wednesday of the following week, 
um, our government had made decisions to meet the West Australian government. And in the joint efforts that we put in place within six months, the community of Warman had been entirely reconstructed. Now, 20 years ago, that wouldn't have happened. 30 years ago, you would drive through, uh, the place would then be called Turkey Creek. You would drive through it, and old timers would tell you that there used to be a town there until the floods had taken it away. A couple of things have happened that to me are highly important. Um, one is, through the leadership of our public sector, we get what we have to do to close the gap in Indigenous disadvantage. And we get that it's a lot more than ever we thought it might be. It is a systemic consideration of what we have to do. We get the need to be quick. We get the need to be flexible. We get the need to expend Australian taxpayers' money efficiently and effectively. And we get it when the people on the ground at Turkey Creek no longer have a house and they should have a house. Now, the response of our government is something that didn't meet the requirements of a, a, a newsworthy report in the Australian. There was no wastage of taxpayers' money. Um, the reportage didn't make the highlight in the Channel 9 news uh, because no one died. There were no spectacular helicopter footage of people being dragged out of swirling waters, um, so it just didn't make it onto Sky News. But there's a community of over 450 people who today have a functioning town, they have homes, they have a school, they have a childcare centre, their art centre is open, their art has been restored and is on its way back to that community and it got there because of the mission that we do here from Canberra. Now, there are a lot of other stories that we can tell and that I'm fond of telling uh, about the quality of our public service. But for me, the fact that that incident was dealt with so quickly and so efficiently and so comprehensively speaks so much for what has been created for the advantage of our country here in the Australian Public Service. Now, this, They're also very good at writing speeches um, and the people who write them think about them a lot. Um, we will, in the course of the next month or so, publish our first capability reviews. Those capability re reviews, when they are published, will be published at the time of the State of the Service report. And the State of the Service report, of course, for those of us who care about the public service, will provide a lot of information uh, about the health of the organisation and about uh, just what it is that comprises our public service. But the capability reviews themselves are a new step, a step into a careful consideration of what it is we're doing, how it is we're doing it, and how well configured our public service departments are to meet the challenges that they will need to meet in the future. I've got no doubt that those reviews will receive some media coverage. But what I'm most confident about those reviews is they will allow us to better look at what we need to be doing to build this highly capable organisation to meet whatever challenges are around the corner to help build the capability of our public service so that all of us who care about it can continue to take the deepest possible pride in what it is that we have created, what it is that we're a part of, and what it is that will continue to build our country and to meet our challenges in the best possible way. Probably a good idea for me to flick to the end of my speech now. Um, and I'll just read the final paragraph. We can be sure of one thing. Its past and current performance indicates that the Australian Public Service is well equipped to address the challenges that it faces and to function better in the rapidly changing global environment of tomorrow. I can be confident of that. I feel uh, when I was uh, in my first conversations 
uh, with Julia Gillard shortly after the formation of the government, uh, the job that I'm doing is the job that I asked to do. Um, when you go in for those conversations uh, and you say, uh, Prime Minister, I'd really like to be a minister, um, and the Prime Minister usually would say, yeah, not a problem, mate. Um, wait over there in the queue. Um, Julia particularly asked me why I wanted to do this particular job. Um, for me, uh, having spent many years growing up in Canberra, um, having done my degree at ANU, and having got a degree of affection for this town, but mostly um, having a deep respect for the capability of our public service uh, to be doing this job uh, has been a complete pleasure. I, set, I spent the better part of the 2000s working for Woodside Energy. And I was fond of making the point to Woodside Energy uh, that without the highly capable public servants at ABARES uh, doing the work that they did to explain the nature of the South Korean energy market, um, then the company for which I worked would not have been able to sell billions of dollars worth of gas into South Korea. Without the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade doing the work that it did to build a market understanding of the potential of China as an LNG market, we would not have written the world's largest LNG contract, a 30-year contract worth $30 billion, which in its day was the largest global resource contract ever undertaken. Um, I'd seen both from growing up in this place and then from doing business with this place the extraordinary capability of our public service. And so to be given an opportunity to serve as minister for this fantastic organisation, you don't get those opportunities so often in life. For me, um, to say this is what I wanted to do uh, was an extremely pleasurable uh, thing. I thank you for what you do. I uh, thank uh, uh, the ANZOG organisation for inviting me here this afternoon to have a yarn, but mostly to be a part of uh, the presentation of awards uh, for people to be recognised for the work that they do uh, within and for and with our public service uh, is a wonderful thing to be doing. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Gary. Um, Gary has um, kindly um, agreed to, to take a couple of questions um, on the topic for the future of the Australian public service. Um, there's some roaming mics going around for those people who might want to put a couple of questions to him. Uh, but maybe I should abuse my position as, as chair to begin. Uh, these awards are a testimony to the fact that we have outstanding public servants at different levels of, of, of governance in Australia. Um, we recently did a survey of um, a sample of, of senior executives um, and we asked them to um, identify what for them was the biggest challenge in 21st century governance in Australia. Um, and the majority identified the challenge of collaborative governance across Commonwealth, states and territories. How do you think we can affect more collaborative governance across Commonwealth, states and territories? Um, I, I think at the first point it's about leadership and capability. Um, I know, and I, I don't make this as a political statement, I know that there is a, a view of thought that you can effectively outsource uh, Commonwealth public servant activities into state bureaucracies. Uh, not all state bureaucracies are as capable as a Commonwealth public service. Uh, not all of them uh, have the same processes and management systems in place to ensure that we have the best possible public service. Uh, and not all have grown their leadership as best they should have. Um, so I genuinely think uh, that the area for uh, the best collaboration uh, is in exercising leadership and in being responsive. Um, I have worked with state bureaucracies that have been simply outstanding. Um, I have worked with uh, the federal public service uh, and I have found it to be in every area what I would aspire for it to be. 
uh, to go back to uh, my previous life in oil and gas, uh, we were able to get a decision to create the largest ever single point investment by an individual company. And I realise that's a lot of qualifications, but it was a $15 billion investment in Pluto that we could only make because of the environmental approvals, processes run out of Canberra, in spite of the very poor advice that we were given out of that very same approvals process in the state of Western Australia. Without the leadership of Canberra, that project would not have taken place. So there are occasions when that leadership does create rankles, it does create confusions. And I can recall in that Pluto project, uh, my boss at that time, Don Volti, um, saying, I don't know why it took 400 approvals here to get this through the system. Um, and I had to point out to him that actually the approvals through both levels of government, even the West Australian government, had come through long before the company itself actually made its final investment decision. And public service is a lot better at doing these things than people give it credit for. And I think often than the public service itself even realises. So I believe that collaboration is best created through capability and leadership, not through uh, simple decisions to cut costs. Thank you, Gareth. Any other questions on the floor? <coughs> um, OK, then a final question for you. <laughs> Um, and this relates to, to, um, to Ahead of the Game. Uh, obviously, Ahead of the Game was heralded as the beginning of, uh, of a major review in sort of, um, enhancing the strategic capability of the Australian public service. Um, and obviously, a lot of initiatives were, were launched at the beginning, um, but it doesn't seem to be having the same profile as it, as it had a, a year or so ago. Um, what is the intention um, from government and from the public service to, to move that agenda it's, on? It's, it's a good point. There's really only one area of ahead of the game where we haven't uh, concluded uh, the work program that we'd wanted to, and we still hold uh, great hopes that we'll be able to, to, to conclude effectively the citizen survey uh, component of that. Most importantly, uh, the public service amendment bill uh, which is currently before the Parliament. Now, if you contemplate the history of Australia in dealing with public service bills, uh, they are normally deeply tortuous processes. And I, I can remember uh, the then Secretary of PMC um, and Steve coming in to see me to put the proposition, to, pri uh, to pitch the thought of an amendment to the Public Service Act. Um, and in a hung Parliament, to put a piece of legislation through is not so straightforward. Um, and so uh, the Secretary of PMC and the Commissioner uh, had this thought that as part of the necessary requirements of the blueprint, and in particular in the consideration of the values, uh, there was a lot of work that we could do to help reshape that act. Um, but it would be really tough. Uh, to which my observation to the Commissioner, to, uh, uh, to Stephen, was to say, it's actually quite easy. Um, if we can do this with the support of the opposition, which we should do, because it is the public service which serves our parliament, um, and therefore the key to it is not what we can get through this hung parliament. The key to it is the government and the alternative of government agree. Now, that bill will become an act when it goes through the Senate as a non-controversial piece of legislation in two weeks' time. Now, to have achieved that, when you contemplate what we went through in 1999, uh, with the add-ons, the changes, the considerations, the peristaltic process um, uh, that the Parliament put the Commissioner in those days through. Um, I think, frankly, Steve did a fantastic job because the, the dialogue and the engagement with uh, Her Majesty's loyal opposition, with Bronwyn, um, was the dialogue which the Commissioner had, which is where I argued it should be. And in that way, uh, that bill sailed through the House of Representatives um, in the space of an hour and a half, uh, and it now has non-controversial status uh, to pass through the Senate during the next week of the Senate sittings, uh, which is a real tribute to the very hard work that had been done through the blueprint and then through the implementation 
of key parts of the blueprint. I don't resolve from the fact that there is the substantial component, the citizen survey, that we haven't concluded, uh, but we've been very quietly going through uh, the business of getting that Public Service Act up in a quiet and efficient way, which is how it should be done. And, and while I'm here, I should also thank Bronwyn um, for the work that she has put in to ensure uh, that that bill has passed as peacefully and easily through the system as it possibly can. As I say, it's the public service and both sides should be standing side by side to support it and to create that framework. Thank you. No, thank you very much. It's now time to celebrate the work of six outstanding Australian public servants who are meeting the challenges which Gary has described for us so clearly. Um, as I stated earlier, these awards are made to Australian public servants at different levels of governance, governmental and non-governmental, who demonstrate excellence in leadership, policy innovation or policy delivery. Each of our award winners will receive an adjunct professorship or fellowship with the Anzog Institute for Governance, along with a framed print of the fresco, the allegory of the good government, which was painted by the Italian artist Lorenzetti. This is what it looks like. Um, and there's some meaning to our, um, to our award of, of um, these frescoes. Uh, Meredith Edwards came across the fresco in the Palazzo Publico, uh, went on a research visit to Siena, um, <laughs> and further to another research visit, this time by Bill Burmester, uh, we decided that for us it encapsulates the, the positive values of, of, of governance, many of which you, you articulated earlier. Um, the allegory of good government consists of groups of figures which represent the main principles of good city governance. Wisdom, justice, accountability, stewardship, legitimacy through responsiveness to the citizenry, and, crucially for me, unity among citizens. Um, in my view, our award winners today exemplify those values of governance. So I will now call upon this year's winners to the stage in alphabetical order. Minister, I am delighted to present to you Glynis Beecham, Secretary in the Department of Regional Australia, Regional Development and Local Government, for the award of a Junk Professorship for Outstanding Public Sector Leadership. <laughs> This way, I was going to say, a little bit citation after each award. Uh, Professor Meredith Edwards, who's the chair of our awards panel, summarises Glynis's contribution to the Australian Public Service in the following way. Glynis has been awarded this excellence award for the outstanding leadership skills that she has consistently exhibited in different roles and at different levels of Australian government. Glynis has played a central role in attempting to solve some of Australia's most difficult public policy problems, and she has done this with great skill, diligence, and integrity. Ladies and gentlemen, Glynis Beecham. <laughs> Minister, I am delighted to present to you Pam Daveron, Deputy Chief Executive of the ACT Government, for the award of Judge Professorship for the promotion of public sector excellence in combating social exclusion and enhancing strategic policy capability in state government. Um, Professor Meredith Edward summarises Pam's contribution in the following way. Pam has been awarded this excellence award for the outstanding work that she has done in both combating social exclusion in the ACT and in enhancing policy capability in state government. Pam's creative policy leadership has been integral to the government's recent successes in this thorny area of public policy. Ladies and gentlemen, Pam Dabble. <laughs> Minister, I am delighted to present to you Ruth Goldsmith, Local Planning Manager of Penrith Council. 
for the award of a fellowship of the Anzog Institute for excellence in the promotion, design, and implementation of sustainable development planning at the local level. Ruth's contribution is summarized in the following way. Ruth has the crucial ability in good policy making of taking a contested academic concept, in this case sustainable development, and turning it into something of practical use which improves the lives of members of the community. This is a unique quality which we are celebrating here today. Ruth Goldsmith. to you Carmel McGregor, Deputy Secretary in the Department of Defence for the award of a Junk Professorship for the Promotion of Public Sector Excellence. Carmel has been awarded this Excellence Award for her outstanding contribution to the promotion of public sector excellence and in particular the work that she has done in enhancing the quality of service delivery in Australia and in advancing the position of women in the Australian public service. Ladies and gentlemen, Carmel McGregor. <laughs> Minister, I am delighted to present to you Megan Lancaster, Director of Stakeholder Engagement at the Murray Darling Basin Authority, for the award of a fellowship at the Anzog Institute in Collaborative Governance. Her contribution to the Australian Public Service is summarised in the following way. The awards panel was of the view that Megan is an exceptional example of an emerging 21st century public servant. She recognises the importance of genuine collaboration in public value creation, that we can only solve many of the intractable problems that we are confronting with the active support and involvement of the citizenry and local communities. She therefore views her role as an empowering rather than a disempowering one. Megan also seeks to develop strong working relationships with knowledge institutions on the basis that the more we know about a problem and how it has been understood nationally and internationally, the better our decisions are likely to be. Ladies and gentlemen, Megan Lancaster. <laughs> Minister, I am delighted to present to you Deborah May for the award of a fellowship of the Anzog Institute for her research and advocacy on gender equity in the workplace. Her contribution to the Australian Public Service is summarised in the following way. Although Deborah has been at the forefront of promoting gender equity in the workplace in Canberra, especially at the executive level, it is her practical contribution that we'd like to celebrate here. She has worked as an executive coach to many senior women and their male colleagues developed and facilitated numerous women's leadership and gender awareness programs, helped organisations develop more women-friendly and inclusive workplace cultures, and more recently has launched an online resource site for women. Deborah's research on the mobilisation of unconscious bias by men against women in the workplace is proving particularly influential in helping organisations develop strategies to ensure that women realise their true potential free from inequitable cultural constraints. Deborah May. <laughs> so Deborah's award concludes this year's celebration. It just remains for me to thank uh, Nilma Matai and her team for their skillful organization of the event this lunchtime. And to thank the Minister, Gary Gray, once again for his invaluable support.